Hi, my name is Ken. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Glad to be here. I checked the guy from Jersey who won the money. And, uh, yeah. I know this guy. He calls on the phone once in a while. Check him out. <laughs> but I'm real glad to be here. And I, I want to thank uh, Al and Alex for making this such an easy trip for me. They've been really, really cooperative. And unlike some of the other people, uh, Al never told me what to say. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is, the, I think, the third one of these. I think you've had seven, and this is the third one I've been privileged to come to. And uh, never once said, hey, stick to the script. Uh, uh, of course, I wouldn't know what that is. Uh, and, uh, you know, we talk about, com yeah, last night we were talking about communication, and, uh, uh, and that's why we have the language of the heart, so we can bypass some of these words. And we were at dinner, and I want to thank Al particularly for giving me... Uh, uh, Brian and Melanie as hosts for the weekend. They've been terrific. But we were at dinner and we were talking about work. And just to show you how, you know, how things can get screwed up in a hurry, uh, Melanie said she had just changed jobs. So I said, oh, to, what, are you, what are you working at? And she said she went to work for the PET, P-E-T, hospital. It was very simple. Uh, I heard her say she went to work for the vet hospital, vets, you know. And I said, oh, we have a big one of those out in our area, and they do a lot with alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> and so being so polite and nice, she didn't say anything to, but today she said, I was a little confused last night because I thought, do they have the alcoholics taking the dogs for walks or like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like what? <laughs> you know? And, and, and that happens all the time, you know, because we all come at this from a, we all bring to the table what we think we're hearing and, and the context in which we thought we heard it. And more importantly, we base everything on our own backgrounds and education like this is the way it's about. And it's, it's kind of like the teacher who was teaching the kid math. And she says to him, Johnny, if there's 12 birds on the fence and I shoot five of them, how many are left? And he says, none. And she says, no, I'll go a little bit slower. She said, you know, yeah. she said, there's 12 birds on the fence and I shoot five of them. How many are left? He says, none. And she said, how did you get that? He said, if you shot five, the other seven would fly away. And she says, well, she said, math wise, you're, you're not real good. She said, but I really like your thinking. And so he said, let me ask you a question. <laughs> and she said, what's that? He said, there are three women walking down the street, and they all have an ice cream cone. One's sucking it, one's licking it, and one's biting it. He said, which one is the married one? <laughs> So she looks at him for a moment, and then she says, the one sucking it. He said, no, it's the one with the wedding ring, but I like the way you're thinking. You know? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, that's, that's simply the way it is. You know, that's what we, we all come to the table from our own little direction. And you know, and that's why this program works so well because it's everything is paradoxical, which means that what you think is this is really that. So what's that is obviously this. So you don't know what's this or that, you know? And everybody who's here seems to understand that, you know? It's the newcomers that have that look like, uh, you know, kind of like a cat on the freeway. <laughs> you know? and, and I was, I, about a month ago, I was down in Mexico, and in front of me was a car accident. Now, a car accident in Mexico is something to behold, because they arrest everybody unless somebody owns up to the crime. And so I speak, unfortunately, no Spanish. And I happened to be there when the accident took place. And both of these guys are trying to woo me into being on their side, but they speak Spanish. And they're both coming at me and being very demonstrative and waving their hands and pointing to the cars and speaking Spanish. And in the middle of it, I just start to laugh. And my buddy who was there said, what are you laughing at? I said, this was, 
this must be what a newcomer feels like in AA. You know, like, you know, <laughs> you know, like, you know like, this is very important, but you have no idea what's going on. Like, you know, like, every, everybody's trying to woo you over, you know, and you don't, you don't, you know, you don't have a clue what's going on. You know? And, and, and everybody kind of comes at this from, from their own deal. And that's why in, in the text, you know, we, we kind of give you these steps very clearly, and then we come with a great line that says, we are not saints. You know, none of us have been able to do this. You know, we don't even come close. The real, the real deal here is to try to raise the bar in your own life each year, regardless of your circumstances. Regardless of what else is going on in your life, uh, in, in terms of circumstances, try to raise the bar spiritually in your own life. Don't compare it to somebody else's. Don't get involved in how you're doing compared to Larry or Mary or whoever. Just try to raise the bar a little bit. And, you know, and it's, that's, those are the kind of paradoxes you deal with. I had a friend, and he was just out of jail, and he spent 22 years in, in penitentiary. And he came out to visit me a couple of weeks ago. And when he arrived, he came. He got no good behavior. He got nothing because he just wasn't good, you know. And uh, he he served every day, every minute, every second. So he didn't have pro parole, probation. He had nothing. He was like a let go guy. And uh, 22 years. So he comes to my place, and we go out to dinner. And without thinking, I took him to this place called the Claim Jumper in San Diego. Where the, where the menu is pretty extensive because I figured this way he has his choice of whatever he wants. And they gave him a menu and started the basic servicing that, that they do in these places. And the waitress was coming over and his menu just started to shake. And he started to sweat and tears were coming out of his eyes. And what it was, was he had never had, in a long time, these kinds of choices. And it was so overwhelming that he was just, I mean, I thought at first he was fanning himself because he was sweating, but it was tied together. And, uh, and the waitress got there and, and he couldn't say anything. Like, you know, he just couldn't say anything. And so she said, trying to be helpful, you know, ah, uh, your friend needs more time. And I said, oh, lady, you know, <laughs> you know, trust me, there's a lot of things he needs, but not more time, you know, like he, if this guy has one more day, it could be too much, you know, he needs no more time, you know, that's for sure, and, and so she walked away, and I, and I got up, and I moved my chair, my chair around by his, and I, and I just put my hand on his hand, and my hand around him, and I said, Ray, relax, I said, there's been times in my life, even recently, where I don't know what I want. Just relax. There's no pressure here. When you get ready, we'll do this. And after the third or fourth day of visiting with me now, of course, he's, he's like a cocky newcomer on a pink glass. Hey, let's go to the claim jumper. You know, let's go. You know, now he's a big time. He knows how the deal works. I said, hey, you know, I don't know if I like you sitting across from me with a knife and a fork, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's how this deal has always been for me. It's always about looking at what's going on right now and watching myself and others trying to fit into that moment and try to be totally in that moment, which is what Brian said try to be totally consumed by that moment because I know something about this moment and that is it's the only moment. Heavy, huh? And, and if you can be totally in this moment then you're not worried about what's in the next moment. You know, it's sometimes when you look at newcomers and you say to them like very casually, you know, like it's a throwaway line now. It's like, did you ever realize that here and now is the there and then you're worried about? And you just say, woo, woo. And you, know, like, you, know, you know they're changing gears in there. Like, whoa, whoa. You know, like they're getting flashback on their whole life. It's like the bottom line is very simple, and that is, is that in order to start in the steps, which is what these guys have talked about throughout the book, is you have to start from a point of being in reality. And sometimes it's 
taking and practicing the steps that put you in that reality. Of course, God knows when we get here, you know, we are not in reality. I mean, we are so delusional, you know. Uh, uh, it's like great lines in the book, the delusion has to be smashed, driven by a hundred forms of delusion. And then about ten years ago, I don't know where it came from, I think it was from the, you know, recovery people, but people started talking about denial. Denial is too wimpy a word. It's just too wimpy a word. If you look it up in the dictionary, what it says is, somebody who knows the truth who doesn't want to own up to it. Big deal. <laughs> Big deal. You look up the word delusion, it says psychotic thought. <laughs> you know? Where the person involved has no reality of the truth. You know? Doesn't have a clue what the truth is, you know? Hell, if you're in denial, that's spiritual growth. You know, like, you know, like, uh, you know, you, you just came out of delusion. You know, yeah, yeah. Now I'm just a liar. Yeah, yeah. Before I was a real nutcase. You know, like, yeah, you know, like, woo, woo. You know, get, get that Thorazine backlash. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the bottom line is, is that uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you start here. You're going to be in the path. You get on the path, you know. And in order to get to the place you've never been, you're going to have to go ways you've never gone. I'm always get amazed when I look at people who tell me that nothing in their life works, but they sure as hell like to hold on to it. You know? <laughs> Say that again slow, because, you know, there's something there I'm missing. You know? And, and that's just the way it is. I got sober in New York. New York has had simple lines for everything. My sponsor would look at me and look at other people he was working with, and I'd hear this over and over and over again. He'd smoke his cigar, and he had a face that looked like he was in a gang war, and his gang didn't show up. You know, like, you know, like, you know. I mean, I, I, I heard Cricket today talking about the tear coming down her sponsor's face and how she was able to trace it back. This guy, you'd need a Thomas Brothers to get back to his eye. I mean, uh, he had lines that went every which way, you know, like, and I used to kid him. I used to, you know, I used to say, you know, uh, youth is a gift of nature, but age is a work of art, you know, like, uh, and, and, but he had that kind of a face, he, you know, like someone closed the door just as he was coming through it. And, uh, and, and, and he used to smoke that cigar when he would say this, and he'd say, you know, kid, you can't shine shit. <laughs> it just won't take a buff, you know. It just won't take a buff, and uh, and uh, you know that's and I did that a good part of my life. I was, I mean, coming away. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Give me another rag, you know. Uh, give me another rag. I got lots of time to do this, you know. And, and the bottom line is, is that, you know, it, it was just one of those things, you know. And, and he used to, you know, he used to look at me because every now and again I'd wear a suit to the meetings and he'd say, you know, you're a psycho in a suit. You know, you, you are one of these people that, you know, you should, you know, no, your homeowners won't cover Ken, you know. And I, and I would kind of just like not know what was going on. And when you don't know what's going on and you're pretending to know what's going on, and you're not in denial, then you're in delusion, you know? And, you know, you can get so comfortable in delusion, you think it's either denial or reality. And sometimes you'd have no clue, and people bring stuff to your attention that makes so much common sense to them. And you look at it like, how did they ever get to that spot, you know? I always thought it paradoxical. In New York, they have great things. When the police want you, they have a thing called a consent warrant. And that is one cop knocks on the front door and the other cop runs around the back and yells, Come in! And, you know, like, and suddenly they're in your home, you know? And then they tell you, you consented. I, I didn't say a thing. I was in the chair. I couldn't move. I thought you were the TV, you know? like. And then what they would do is, as they were handcuffing you, you talk about paradox, as they were handcuffing you, they were telling you all the rights you had. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right. You just can't go anywhere. You know, like and say, so, like, why don't you just take the can handcuffs off and let the rights go? You know, like uh, I don't need that many rights when I'm in handcuffs. You know, I need rights when I got rights. You know, when I'm on the move. And the bottom line is, is that when I first got here, 
this was a mystery to me. I had no idea because it was like, it wasn't the language of the heart, it was the language of the old timers, you know. There, turn it over. It's in the book. Everything was in the book, you know. Like I used to look in that book, you know, the, and, and it was like a, you know, it was like long before I realized that it was an owner's manual. You know, I, I, I always thought that someday I'd live my life in such a way that somebody would write a book about me. And they did, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a drunk, you know, like, I'm in that book on every page. And so I, I kind of just looked at the book and say, like, you know, let me find a part about going to jail, how to avoid that, you know. It wasn't in the index, you know, how to pay the electric bill, you know. Wait, I got no electric, ah, it's in the book. You know, you guys got another edition or what? You know, I just, I mean, I'm not finding half of this stuff you're mentioning. You know, I just don't find it anywhere. And, and the bottom line for me was, is that it's because when I got here, I was a complete psycho. I mean, people knew I was an alcoholic, but I wasn't ready for this program because I wasn't anonymous. Everybody knew I drank. You know, like, you know, my mother used to look at beer cans, and she loved me more than anybody else in the world. And she'd look at beer cans, and then she'd look at me, and she'd say, I don't know what they put in here that makes you act so stupid. And, uh, and she was my support system, you know? Like, uh, and so it was like everybody kind of knew what was going on, you know? I, I kind of like had animals that looked at me, and then I looked back, and they go, <laughs> never mind, forget about it, you know? I mean, things were happening in my... Guys who loved me threw me out of a card game because I was betting crazy. And I mean, threw me out. I was so obnoxious. They, I, we were on the sixth floor. They threw me down to about the fourth floor. And I, whatever way I landed, I landed on my feet. And there was a cat on the landing. And he looked at me. And what I heard him say was, nice landing, you know? I, <laughs> I'm sure he said something to that effect, you know? Like, but... I was hearing things that nobody was saying. I was in places where nobody knew. I mean, I was like, uh, had I been a fight, they would have stopped it. They would have said, go to your corner, you had enough. You know, it's a technically over, you lost. And, and I didn't know that. And that's the way I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I came in here, it was like people were talking about things that maybe I had heard years ago and forgotten. Or maybe I just misunderstood. But they start talking about spiritual things and, and getting close to God and, and getting into doing this and, and trying to work on changing your life and, and that I suffered from I suffered from a spiritual malady. I suffered from a soul sickness. And if I could work on overcoming that spiritual malady, I would straighten out mentally and physically. And I thought, what great words. What great words. But I didn't know how to do it. So I said, well, how do you do it? And they said, you know, it's real tricky. We, we put it in the book here on how it works. You know, like, we realize you're a little quick, but let's see if we can find it, you know? And, you know, like, I have questions about God. You know, there's a whole chapter about that. I have questions about this. You know, what about the employer? Let's see if there's a chapter on that. You know, I, there just wasn't a chapter into thinking, you know, because you don't want an alcoholic to be thinking. We scratch stuff that doesn't itch. You know, like we, we, turn, we turn solutions into problems. You know, we see things that aren't there. You know, I, I used to think it was my job to make up problems where none existed. You know, I used to think that was a full-time task of mine. Like, uh, I guess they're not aware of this. And they weren't aware of it because it wasn't happening. You know, <laughs> it's kind of hard for someone to be aware if it's not happening. You know, and, and I used to kind of just look at them like they're really missing out on a lot. And, and you know... I was like a tilt on a pinball machine, you know, I, I mean, I mean, you know, send him back, you know, put a cover on him, put do not open till Christmas, something, but get him out of the way. And, and I realized that as I was here more, everything over the last, oh, I'd say 15, 20 years, I see it kind of relates to the program. I had a guy who was going through some tough times. He wanted to be, he wanted to do AA on his own at home, where he wouldn't be interrupted by fact or fellowship. And uh, so I went to see him at his office because his wife had asked me to do that. I give him one more bell ring. So I went in, and, and in his office he has a picture, and it's a picture of a man on a horse going off a cliff. And on the way down, it's a comedy kind of thing. the The rider is pulling on the reins, yelling "Whoa!" And so I went in and I looked at that. And he said, you like that? I said, yeah. 
He said, do you really like it? He said, it's just a print I have. I said, yeah. He said, why do you like it? I said, because it reminds me of you and other alcoholics trying to do the program by themselves. You know? You're, you're, you're on a horse that's already gone off the cliff. And you think you're in charge because you can yell, whoa! You know? uh, you're going to hit a bottom. I mean, you know, it's just no way that horse, as much as it may want to respond to your wishes, is, is dealing with something called reality and gravity. And, uh, you know, and that's the way it is. If you want to do this thing at home alone, then you might as well just buy a bottle because it just doesn't work that way. You have to be, you know, the old times you say, if you don't want to get hit by a train, don't go down to the tracks. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> Thanks, partner. <laughs> wow, you know. I'm glad I quit sooner than he did. You know? <laughs> wow, you know. I got nothing. I, I lost my wife. I lost my kids. I lost my job. I lost my career. I lost my license. And my dog went away. But if you want what I have, <laughs> you'll start working on it. Let me take a breather first before I get going. You know, I get, they have a language. It's all their own. You feel like, God, this is like, you know, I got dropped into a remedial group or something. Like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, you figure, oh, my God. And then, and then you don't know, have any clue as to what's going on. And then somebody comes along, my sponsor, and he grabbed me the first meeting I was at. And he said, I'm going to be your temporary sponsor. And he said, just till you get going, because uh, it looks to me like you're going to need some direction. And so I figured, well, you know, I'll, I'll do that. And, you know, uh, I'm over 29 years sober, and he's still my temporary sponsor. <laughs> and I don't know if it's going to work. You know, you know. <laughs> but... You know, something happens, and those of you, I feel privileged to have long sponsorship with the same person, because something happened somewhere along the 10th, 12th, 15th year. We were no longer sponsor and sponsee. We were kind of like two yahoos on the path. And we've gotten to the point now, I don't know how you chat with your sponsor, but we've gotten to the point where we don't have to give any preliminary statements. He knows he's getting my rough draft, and I know I'm getting his rough draft. And it's not a matter of going like, well, are you saying this? I never have any trouble understanding what he's saying. And he never seems to have any trouble understanding what I'm saying. That was not the case when we started. When we started, you know, I would call him. I was a whimper. I was a one. <laughs> she left me. Good for her. She'd show some class, you know. <laughs> you know. I'm going to jail. Good. That's where you belong, you know. <laughs> I can't see my kids. Good. It's about time they caught a break, you know. Like, uh, and, and then he'd always say something at the end that kind of tied me together with his humanity. He'd say, hey, Ken, maybe you get lucky and die tonight. And he'd hang up. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and suddenly I, suddenly I had to deal with a whole different set of problems, you know. <laughs> and we often kid about that today. He, he... He now lives across the street where, from the house he used to live in. He sold the house, and it was an older home, and the new people moved in, and they tried to hook up air conditioning without upgrading the wiring. So two days after the house was sold, it burned to the ground. And he said, yeah, he said, my wife and I sit on the porch. <laughs> and I watch him rebuild it, saying, no kidding, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> you know, boy, what a good idea. And he said, I'm getting to watch them rebuild the house. And, and uh, he had a daughter. And that's when I knew he was my kind of guy. He had a daughter who wasn't happy at home. She was 16 years old. She, it was a very large family. There was a lot of traffic in their house. There were folks coming and going all the time. And, and she just felt like she was being left out of the loop. So she was going to run away. So she confronted him with the fact that if things didn't change, she was going to run away. So he said, don't run away yet. Let me, give me a week or two to put something together. So what he did was he had an attic, and he put a dormer up there, and he put a set of stairs up there, and he made a little apartment for her. And he said, this way you can run away, and if you ever need dinner, we're down here having dinner, you know? So she moved up there, and she lived there for a couple of months and before she started coming down to dinner again. But the deal was is that he didn't get into something really wacko. He got into a solution. And he was always gentle and kind with me. I mean, when I say gentle and kind, it wasn't mean he wasn't direct. He was always gentle and kind. 
I was like a basket case when I got here. You know, I, I, I grew up in, in Brooklyn, and, you know, it was like, uh, I, I don't know whether it was the neighborhood. It certainly wasn't my mom. My mom was a basic gal. She raised seven kids. I was the youngest. My dad died when I was young. She loved us. I have no problems with my mom. I was just a nutcake. You know, I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I would do things that would, sometimes people would look at you and say, why are you doing that? And it's embarrassing when you don't have answers. And you just did it. You know, like, why would you do that? Ah, you know, ah. you know, you know, give me some, give me some reasons and I'll pick one. Like, I'm trying to make it multiple choice, you know, like, uh, give me a shot. Let me get my foot in the door here. But when I got here, I mean, this was, this was like where I was at. I went, this man used to invite me over to his house because I wasn't working then. And I was unemployable. And, and, uh, it's kind of hard to get sober and do your old job, which was I used to officially find things before people officially lost them. And, uh, and so if you're going to get sober, you need a career change, you know. And, and so, the, so the reality was is that he used to say, come over to my house and I want you to do this or that. And he'd bring me over, keep me connected to his family. And he'd always provide me with dinner. And then we'd go to a meeting. We did that every single day. And he was just so nice to me. And then after about a month and a half seven weeks, whatever it was, he had a 12-step call, and we went on it together. And that's the first time he's asked me to go with him on one of these. So we're out there, and the, this gal had called and said she wanted uh, someone to come and pick her husband up. He was interested in doing that initially, but when we got there, he wasn't into it. And so my sponsor was a city, you know, sometimes the, tr the parking is such you can't find a parking space. So he said to me, go snag this guy and bring him on out, and we'll take him to the meeting. That was the first time he specifically asked me to do something after all the nice things he had done for me. So I went to the door and knocked, and the guy's wife came to the door, and she said he changed his mind after I told her who I was. I'm thinking, this is my first assignment. <laughs> I said, let me talk to him. So she goes and gets him, and of course he's happy, joyous, and free. And he comes to the door, and somewhere in there he said something about my ancestry and get away, and, and I knew my sponsor was coming around. And so as my sponsor tells this story, when he came around, I had snagged this guy through the door, and I was beating him with a garbage can lid. <laughs> you know? And I got this garbage can lid just smacking it into this guy's face, and he like, this is my job. You're going to that meeting. And I'm like, hey. You know, like, and so when my sponsor got there, he like retrieved me like a dog. You know? And uh, so I get back in the car. <laughs> and we take off down the street. And we're about three, four blocks away before a little sanity returns. And, and he looks over at me and he says, uh, do me a favor. I said, what? He said, don't tell anybody I'm your sponsor for a while. <laughs> and he said, do me another favor. I said, what? He said, never, never, never consider that a 12-step call. You know, like, and not a 12-step call. I mean, when I got sober, I was like, they, they, wanted, they said, get a guy. I got him. I mean, I, I went places you wouldn't go. I went alone. I, you know, I went places where you, you just would not imagine me being. I couldn't imagine me being, but it was like, this was your job. I thought it was your job. You were like a professional retriever. You had a, you know, they called, you went. And, and I was like, you know, I'd see guys like, he's getting away, cut him off, you know. Ch you know I was chasing guys down and like cutting their cars off. And hey, you're supposed to be at the meeting, you know. And, 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 and he had to kind of give me a real good verbalization about that because he said, you know, it's a program of attraction. You know, not kidnapping. You know, like, you know, this, you know, this guy actually has a right not to come if he wants. You know? And I thought, well, you know, if, if he calls us, he should at least show up, you know. <laughs> and so I had, I had a different reality altogether. And then when I started through the steps, what happened was I began to see that there was a me that I had never looked at before. In fact, I had, was totally out of touch with that person. And that was the person I was going to have to become because I sure as hell could not live the way I was living. I mean, I had, I had pain that came out as anger. 
And that anger was so severe in my life that I could actually black out behind anger, just like I blacked out behind booze. I could get into a rage and suddenly, you know, uh, become somebody who I sh sure as heck wouldn't be proud of. And it was like when it was over, I'd get glimpses of the fact that, you know, this is not the way you should do this. But I just didn't seem to have whatever you needed. And so now I'm into the steps. I'm going to these meetings. I'm going to retreats. Even early on, they used to have back on the East Coast something called the Matt Talbot Retreat. And some of you guys may know that. But it's, it's like we, we used to go to that. And, you know, and I even knew on the retreat there was something going on. Because we went the first time to Jersey. And we went to a place called Long Branch. And there was a retreat house there. And there was uh, these uh, guys, uh, Jesuits, who had this retreat house. And, and there was a thing of rocks that went out into the water. And so they had a break. And my sponsor said, why don't you get off by yourself and read the big book somewhere? So I said, oh, good. So I walked out on these rocks. I sat down. This is November, November the 20th or something. I got a picture of this, of, and they got pictures of this. And I'm sitting there, and I'm reading, and I said, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm really starting to feel like serenity is coming into my life. I'm feeling totally relaxed. I am totally at peace for the first time in my life. And I don't know, maybe an hour and a half later, I get up to go back, and I didn't realize there were tides. <laughs> and the rocks in back of me now are gone. It's water. And I'm like, wow, how do I get in from here? So I took off my shoes and socks and dropped my slacks and, and in my underwear with my big book wrapped around this stuff and a belt, I'm swimming the dog paddle into the... And these guys are drinking coffee on the veranda like that, <laughs> watching me, you know. You know, and, and uh, they're going, hey, you know, here he comes, the retriever here. He comes up. <laughs> we didn't even know he was water certified, you know. And, you know, and, and I'm like, uh, and I'm trying to keep the big book, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and my sponsor that night says, you know, I, I really love you. He said, you're better than a home entertainment unit. You know, like, <laughs> he, said, he said, you're the kind of guy, he said, I just was been waiting for, he said, because he said, most of the other guys are r rational, you know, like, and, and I, he said, he, he, he said, you're like an electric storm, you know, you just never know when you're going to, like, start igniting stuff. And, and, and that's, that's the way it was. Now, I go through these steps, I do these things, and what starts to happen to me is this person that I didn't know starts to emerge. And this person that I couldn't live with starts to diminish, starts to go away. And I'm finding myself more and more at peace in more and more ways. My wife and I were separated for 18 months and then we got back together again. We, you know, she decided that I was worth a second shot. And we were back together in July. And she had moved to Pennsylvania to be near her mom because her mom lived there. And, and so I moved up there for a while. And uh, what happened was it was a 4th of July deal. And there was a lot of noise. And they were setting off fireworks. And it was okay to like to 10 or 11, but then it was getting later. And my, and my kids were smaller, and they were waking my kids up, and the youngest boy was a little concerned about the firecrackers. So my deal was, is, you know, I knew how to handle this, you know. So I got a 38, <laughs> and I snub-nosed 38, and I'm putting it in my belt, and she says, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go talk to the guys about the fireworks. <laughs> and uh, she said, why don't we do this? Why don't we call the police? You mean invite them to come here? <laughs> she said, yeah, why don't you just call them and invite them to come here? And then we'll tell them about this. This was a whole new concept. You usually don't call the police. You know, They usually come looking for you after the event, but you very seldom call them before the event. And so I said, okay. So I called the number, and these policemen came out, and they went over and they shushed the crowd and got it quieted down and the fireworks and so I was talking to my sponsor about it and I said uh, guys were, he said how'd your fourth go ah, there was a lot of fireworks and a lot of disruption and noise and stuff but I took care of it he said oh I can't wait to hear this <laughs> he said what'd you do I said well I, I called the police 
He said, aren't wives great? <laughs> like, he knew right away that was not my idea, you know? And that's the kind of relationship we have. I mean, I don't have to say anything. I just have to say hello, and he can fill in the whole sentence at this point. And, and so I, I, I realized that, that this was a guy I enjoyed being around. This was somebody who had something. I, you know, he had a wife and the kids, and, and they all weren't, lived in the same place. And like, I, I watched him go to work. I watched him come home. I watched him do things routinely that I thought, this is impressive. And I started to do those things. I started to do the ritual of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're new, you know, listen, listen to the old timers because they're old timers. I don't care if you like them. I don't even care if you understand them. Listen to them. You know, it's always just, you know, be what you is and not what you ain't. Because if you is what you ain't, you ain't what you is. Okay, Lou, you know. Wow. One too many shot glasses. You know? <laughs> but people will just stop you. And, and that's the way they are in the air. If they like you, they really do that kind of stuff. They kind of get up in your face. And, I got my eye on you. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll put back the styrofoam cup, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like, you know, like, I mean, they, they're in their own little world, and, 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 and you know that because you're in yours, you know, like, and I started doing these meetings, and, and I started, things started happening, things just started happening, and most of all, I became more and more comfortable with life, and I started to move away from delusion. And I started to understand that there was a subtext that goes on here uh, all the time that means that the culmination of everything that's here is much greater than all the parts. You know, it's kind of like a clock, an old grandfather clock. When, when you take that grandfather clock apart, there's absolutely nothing in there that represents the tick. But when you put it together and you start it, the tick comes back. And I was looking for the tick in my life. I, I was just looking for something that would allow me to put my head on my, on my pillow and go to sleep. And my sponsor used to support that by saying the best things. He'd say, remember, Ken, a clear conscience makes a soft pillow. And if you're doing the right things, you're going to get good things in your life. It's kind of like this ocean out here. You know, there's a tide to it. It goes out. It comes in. When it's coming in, it seems good. Everything's coming your way. There are times in your life, you know, I hear people mean, well, you know, the parking guard got me the parking spot. And, you know, the first in line guard got me the first in line at the bank. And, uh, and the traffic guard made the traffic go away. And, you know, <laughs> you know and, and that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what sustains me regardless of what else is going on. I don't have to explain it. I don't have to understand it. I just have to experience it. And I, when I do the right things that you guys have taught me to do here, I get to experience it. And there are times when that tide is going out and everything seems to be going away. And if you're doing the right things and you're doing the ritual of the program, you don't have to chase after it. Of course, you know from experience, in some period of time, it will all start to come the other way again. Because that's just the ebb and flow of life. And, and the nice thing about life that I've learned is that living in this moment is the only place I can live. And it's only the only place I can meet God, you know. The text tells us that. It says, you know, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, now. And I used to look at that word now because it always impressed me. And then it, you know, it's almost like I'm dyslexic at times. I, I reversed it. And when you reverse the word now, you get the word one, W-O-N. And when you've learned to live in the now, you've won. Life gets real easy because you're not worried about stuff that you may not even be around to cash in on. You just start doing what's in this moment. And in order to have any profound change in your life, you have to start from somewhere. So it's best to start right now. And if you know where you are in the moment, then you can start to move into the next moment with some sense of clarity in your life. And you can get to experience like two moments together, then three, then four, and then the next thing you know, they're starting to string together. You're actually 
aware that you're aware. And you're in this moment and you have absolutely no anticipation of what comes next. It's like, who cares? I am so focused on this that when this is over, whatever's supposed to be there will be there. And I've learned from being around Alcoholics Anonymous that if God wants me to have it, there isn't anything I can do to screw it up. And if I'm not meant to have it, there's absolutely nothing I can do to get it. You know, you know, he's up there sometimes, I think, <laughs> can you believe what he's trying to do now? You know, you know, and, and, and I know he has that way. And I can't wait to get there wherever you go, because that's what I'm going to say to him. <laughs> Very funny, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> and. And the reality is, is you, you, you realize that perception plays such a big role in this. Uh, uh, I, I bought uh, several months ago this, this tape that Clancy had on, on perception because I've heard so many people talk about it and I never heard it. And, and then right after that, after listening to that, and it was an excellent tape, and then right after that, I was about three months down the road, four months down the road, and I'm watching television one night, and they're showing great football games of all times. And one of them was the game between Boston College and the University of Miami back in the 80s where Doug Flutie threw this pass at the end of the game that wins the game for Boston College, which shouldn't have won, and it's like just referred to as the pass. And the guy they had doing the show, who was narrating the show, was co-hosting it, was a guy by the name of Flaylin. Now, Flaylin was the guy who caught the pass. He said... In the Flutie house, it's the pass. In the Flaylin house, it's the catch. You know? <laughs> he said, you never hear Mrs. Flaylin, my mother, say, that's the pass. No, it's the catch. My son made that catch, you know? So it's like, that's the context of life. We, and that's why in Alcoholics Anonymous, you get to realize we're all swimming in the same water here, and the idea is not to pollute it, you know? And, and, and so it gets real, real simple. You hear people say, well... <laughs> It's just too hard to swim in life, you know. It's a, such a burden. Well, come down to shallow end with me and the kids, you know. First of all, if you get tired, you just stand up. It's three feet, you know, like, no big deal. And plus that, it's usually much warmer, you know what I mean? So come on down here, you know, like, you know, do yourself a favor, you know. Come on down here, you know. If you ain't over your head, come on down to the shallow end, you know. Like, you don't have to stay where you're at and be hurting. And you have to be, listen to the people around you, because they're telling you what's going on. You know, it's like the alcoholic who says, I'm my own worst enemy. And his wife said, not while I'm alive. You know, like, uh, you know? Uh, so the feedback you get from the people around you will pretty much tell you what's, what's going on. You know, I saw a cartoon in the New Yorker several weeks back, and it, and it, was, a, it was a guru guy. And he was with a little guru guy. And they were sitting in that guru pose, doing guru stuff. And, and the older guru was looking at the younger guru who had this real quiz, quizzical kind of look on his face. And the older guy was saying, the caption said, this is it. <laughs> you know? You're looking for something else. This is it. <laughs> and I think that's AA personified. You know, like you came in and said, well, what did I get out of this deal? Okay, you're sober. Okay, I'm sober. You got a job. I got a job. You're not in jail. I'm not in jail. Yeah, you clean up your bill. I'm cleaning up my bill. Yeah, you got a wife that loves you. Yeah, I got it. And you got kids to respect. Yeah, yeah. But when's the payoff? <laughs> you know? Hey, Swifty. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you. You wouldn't know the payoff if it hit you right between the eyes, you know, because you're not appreciative, you know. If you don't appreciate what you have, it's almost sinful to pray for more. Because we're the guardians here of our own lives in this moment. And we don't want to we don't want to get lost in the shuffle. You don't want to be distracted so much from your life that at the end of the of the end of the term here on this planet, you realize I didn't live my life, my life lived me. If you don't if you don't put conscious thoughts together, then what happens is you live unconsciously. And then pretty soon what happens is life starts slipping away from you. And you hear people say, well, I'm lost, I'm this, I'm that. You know, and if you just slow down, what will happen is you'll start to hear the sound of silence. And the sound of silence is really God speaking. 
that's the sound of silence. I have never talked to anyone who told me that right in the middle of a frenzy, they heard God speak to them. You know, yeah, I was out in traffic, and I got out to change a tire, and I got hit, and I was going 30 yards through the air, and I thought, hey, God, you're talking to me. You know, I, And I read about all these people who are mystics or, or whatever you are, whatever religion it is, and, and they all got away for a period of time and went out into the desert or the mountains or whatever. They took time to recollect themselves because this world is, is, is very deceptive, very, very deceptive. It lets you believe because you're sitting in a chair in a room in Virginia Beach surrounded by people and buildings and land that there's a permanence here. And there is no permanence. It's very impermanent. Everything in your life that you love will either die, change, or go away. That's a tough fact to live with, so we avoid it. And what the steps did to me is it told me, hey, Get busy doing action, as I think Earl said, rather than activity. Don't be worried about the activity. Get busy doing action. You know, start doing the things you need to do so that you can raise the bar spiritually. Information, you know, knowledge, information only gave me, or knowledge only gave me information. But experience has given me transformation. When I experience something, it becomes part of my experience, then it helps me to impact the way I'm going to do things. Reading, you know, if you had a big book here, and I'd show it to you, uh, if you had a big book and you just read it, it would, buy, it would be like reading an exercise book. You wouldn't get in shape by reading it. You've got to do the activities. You got to do the yeah. You know, get up in the morning and run a mile. Oh, I'm going to do that. Yeah, lift weights. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, you know, to do sit-ups, 25. Oh, terrific. You know, hey, I don't know. This book isn't working. You know, it's amazing. That's the way people look at the big book. It's like, well, I read it. Big deal. <laughs> you know? And cover to cover. Wow, I'm really impressed. You know, did you do any of this stuff? Well, you know, it kind of slows you down. You know. Let's look at this chapter, into loafing, you know? <laughs> into postponing, into evading, you know? It's not about that. It's about doing the action. And that's why, you know, I, I love conventions now. When I first started doing conventions, they were, they were very new to me because the first several years I was sober, we didn't have conventions in, in New York. We just didn't have conventions. I mean, once uh, once a year they had the, the uh, Bill Wilson deal, and they would hold that at the Waldorf Astoria, and it was a dress, tie, and tux kind of deal. But, I mean, even today it's not a big deal. I mean, you look at the, the stuff they send down from Box 459, you never see the Bronx Fall Festival, you know, like uh, the Brooklyn Roundup, you know, like... <laughs> if they're rounding them up in Brooklyn, it's not to come to AA, you know? <laughs> you know, it's... it's uh, but, but these deals are good because what it does is it allows you to hear a, a, an array of people who all come from different backgrounds, but we're all on the same path. And it doesn't matter how we say it. It doesn't matter whether it's grammatically correct or incorrect. It doesn't matter whether it sounds good or sounds harsh. The main thing is, as long as we're doing the actions, everything else is in material. You know, my deal has always been, and I've said this many times, I, I feel like you come in, you talk, and, and then you guys get to meet me, I get to meet you, we visit for a little bit, and then I'm out of here. You don't know, you don't really know me from a jar of Vicks, you know. You wouldn't know me unless you came home and then watched me go through the day. You watch me go through a day, then you know who I am. Watch me go through a week. Get to see me do the things that I do. And like the other folks who are here, that's really where I'm in play. This is like an add-on, you know. This is like icing on the cake to get a chance to come to a beautiful environment, be hang out, and do this thing. But my life is daily, moment, moment to moment, doing the things that I learned to do here. You know, I'm the youngest of seven, and as I said, you know, in my family we're divided into two groups: either you're in AA or you need it. And 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 unfortunately for my brothers and sisters, none of them made this thing. And so the end result is, is there's only four of us left. I lost three members of my families to this thing.
two sisters and a brother. I had a sister die in October of 85. I had a sister die Christmas Day of cirrhosis of 85. A couple of months later, weighing about 60, 70 pounds after she had hemorrhage for like two or three weeks. And then a week later, after burying her, my brother died, New Year's Day. I had a brother and a sister die on the two holidays, one Christmas and one New Year's, a week apart. We're in the same funeral home. We're stepping over my sister's grave to bury my brother. My mother died that August because she just never figured this would happen. And the end result of that is that when, when you see the loss that goes on in life, and not just my loss, other people lose. It's the reality that you just don't have this time to waste. Like, I, today, anger is totally removed from me. I don't have time to be angry with people. I don't have time to, to sit around and figure out what you're doing that I like or don't like. You know, the big book has a great line in it. It says, love and tolerance is our code. And if you hear this, you'll be way ahead for the weekend. That if you're here long enough, you don't need tolerance. Because tolerance implies judgment. You just will need love. If you can love unconditionally, then you don't need tolerance. Tolerance is needed because you're judging something. But if you just love, and that's what I like about AA, is that somebody can go out and totally screw up and come back to the meeting and be made to feel like, hey, you know, so you stumbled and you fell. Now you get up and you get back in the race. And now you have that experience, if you're willing to bring it, to give us all something else to hang our hat on that enhances us. Every negative thing enhances us. Every positive thing enhances us. If it's part negative and part positive, it enhances us. I mean, this is a win-win situation. If it becomes your experience and it impacts the way you live your life, it's your experience, it's terrific. And you don't have to figure out a whole lot of stuff. You know, this is not about thinking. You know, you, you, you don't want alcoholics sitting around thinking, you know? You know, it's like lighting a fuse. You know, sooner or later you're going to hear a big bang, you know, because, you know, we self-destruct. And the reality of coming to AA has always been for me that on the outside, I am still a loon, you know. Not, you know, people look at me, you know, I am, must have a wacko magnet because everybody who's wacko in my area, I sponsor, you know. I was telling Brian, there was a guy who was at a meeting in our area, and he punched it. He was new, and he punched out a speaker. Didn't like what he said when the guy got off the deal. He, bam! He knocked him out at the meeting. And everybody's calling, Come on, you sure got it? It's a meeting I'd never go to, but I must have had six phone calls about it. So about four days after the event, I get a call. Hey, Ken, this is Patrick. You may have heard of me. I punched a guy out at the meeting. I need a sponsor. <laughs> he says, you mind if I come over to your house? I said, hold on, Patrick. I said, this is serious business. I said, do you wet the rug? He said, no, I don't pee on anybody's rugs. I said, do you, do you leave marks on the wall? He said, no, I don't even know marks on the wall. I said, okay, you come over. I said, I always like to make sure my newcomers are house broke. So, <laughs> so, so he came over, and, and this guy is, he thinks he's a tough guy. And what he is, is he's totally afraid of life. And most tough guys are totally afraid of life. Fear looks like tough guy, but, but it's nothing more. Clint Eastwood's a tough guy in his Dirty Harry movie, because he doesn't say too much. <laughs> so what do you think, Clint? Gotcha. You know? <laughs> it's the guy who's screaming and yelling that's always afraid. So he came over, and I have a guy I sponsor who's Persian, and I forgot to tell him he was there. And this guy goes in my room and prays on a prayer rug. And, and he's, he's a Muslim. So he's inside, and Patrick comes in, and he's sitting on the couch, and he starts talking. And all of a sudden, Sam does this deal where he's quiet, and then he prays. And so it's quiet when he gets there. And we're talking for a few minutes, and then he hears, Whoa, 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 You know, coming out of the bedroom, he said, What the hell is that? I said, Oh, it's Sam doing his third step, you know. It's, uh, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> he says, What's that? Uh, 
Uh, you'll get to that. You know, you'll get to that. <laughs> I said, you're still at number one. You're powerless and punchy, you know? You know uh, but you know, this is, I have, I have been, and, and I think you've heard this collectively from, from every speaker that I heard. I, I didn't get to hear, I apologize, Sterling, because we were late to lunch, but I heard it from every other speaker, and I'm sure he said the same thing. And that is, is that this is a way of life that yahoos like us would have never had had we not had the disease of, of alcoholism. I don't understand this disease at all, even today, except to say that every time I think I understand it, I'm wrong. I was asked to speak at a graduation, an alcohol graduation from the San Diego court system. It's the first one they, in the country. It's been on CBS now on, on uh, 60 Minutes and stuff. They get you, and if you stay sober for 15 months, they exonerate, take the, the records of your arrest, expunge is the word I'm looking for. They expunge your, that's a big word. They expunge your records after 15 months of sobriety. And the night you're arrested, they take your picture. And then they make up like an album for the class, like a class book, yearbook. And it shows you the night you were arrested and then graduation night they take your picture and I mean you would not believe these pictures in addition to that it's a fantastic deal the judges who sentenced you to this are sitting in the front row and the policeman who arrested you gives you your certificate gives you your graduation certificate and they all have t-shirts that say I beat the rap you know and this guy came up, and he'd probably be a circuit speaker sooner or later, because this guy came up, he said, I knew God was in my life. <laughs> he said, because my arresting officer's name was Angel. <laughs> and there he is, Angel Ramirez, you know. Hey, Angel, I made it, you know. It was very dignified. It was, uh, and, and you say to yourself, you know, I look back sometimes when I'm sitting out there and I see Bill and Bob and I say, when these two guys bumped into each other, the divine intervention that must have been there, to think that everything that has happened over the period of time since they bumped into each other, and here we are sitting in these rooms. Here we are with literature. Here we are with a sense of purpose. Here we are with a direction in life. Here we are a chance for the gold ring. Here we are every day being given the opportunity to get up, get in the game, and play by the rules. And at the end of the day, being able to say, wow, this is much better than a V8. You know, this is ecstatic, you know. And then interact with people that you know are just bonkers. And yet you know they're on the path, you know. <laughs> yeah? You're not sure all the time which path. And you're not sure they're even touching the path, you know. But you know they're heading in this direction, you know. And you say, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I get a chance to do that day in and day out. I get a chance to go to lunch, go to dinner, meet at this guy's house, go to a restaurant, talk to my sponsor, pick this bozo up and take him to a meeting, you know, go to the jail and bail somebody out and take him to a meeting and, and hear a mother say, you know, like, my kid's doing pretty good, you know, this is going on, or, you know what, Kenny had some trouble, but now he's, he's doing okay. And all these good reports of what goes on in life. I don't watch a whole lot of TV. I don't go to the movies very often. I don't read the newspaper. I don't have time for delusion. I need to live in reality. And I need to know what reality is because sometimes when I brush up against delusion, old ideas lead me to believe like, hey, it wasn't so bad, you know? <laughs> and I have to stay active doing the things that keep me active. And I interacted with several of you today on a one-to-one -one basis, and all I can say is thank you for sharing what you shared with me, because it gives me a clue that you guys here in this area are doing the same thing we're doing in our area. 
And they're doing it the same way in Yasco, and they're doing it the same way in Oklahoma, and in Texas, and in Laguna, and and in and in Omaha, and 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 and, and, and probably sometimes too down in Washington, huh? You know. <laughs> and that, but they're doing it. And the reality is, is that what a great thing. Every time I get off the plane to go somewhere, I'm already there. I'm there at a meeting. You know, I can get off a plane anywhere in the country, make a phone call, and be with people who I want to be with almost instantaneously. The average bloke don't have that chance. You know, I have been given the key to the kingdom. You know, this is it. I'm in the, you know, I'm in the candy store 24 hours a day. Sometimes I feel terribly gluttonous, but it never slows me down. You know, that I've been given so much. And I know there's no soul saved here uh, later on. So I'm going to wind down. And I'm going to wind down just by telling you that in the last two or three years in my own life, I have had a clarity of the reality of a lot of things that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. I understand the real significance of them today. I didn't understand them at the time. There's a lot of things that God has put me in a position to do that I would have never of my own accord volunteered to do. In 1990, I was retired. I was never going to have to go back to work again. I had a pension plan for the rest of my life. And then it went defunct. And I ended up going back to work. There were people, I found out later, who was really jealous of the fact that I didn't have to work at that time. Never caused me any lack of sleep. But going back to work was a good thing. I can't believe I'm even saying that. Because it's very easy, and I found myself starting to do it. I was getting frozen in my sobriety. I was getting comfortable with being comfortable doing the same things. It's not like they were bad things, but they were the same things. And I read something in Bill's writing that just was electric to me, where he said, the good is often the enemy of the best. And you can get comfortable doing things that are comfortable. But if you get too comfortable, you may not be too interested in raising the bar. You may not be too interested in doing the things that you need to do to grow spiritually. And as the book says repeatedly, if we don't expand our spiritual life, we usually end up in trouble. And that this life is basically about being of service to others. And that being of service to others represents the foundation of our recovery. And if you want to be happy, joyous, and free, it's a byproduct of doing the right things. It's not the deal itself, it's doing the right things. And as you do them repetitively and practice them as best you can, what happens is it becomes a way of life. And so I thank you for all of your input, individually and collectively. Thank. Al and Alex and all the gang and Brian and Melanie and all the folks who have been here. I truly, truly love you. And I say that because now I understand what it is. I used to be able to verbalize love but have no understanding of it. But now, I don't say it too often, but I know the action that's connected with it. And the action that's connected with it is called commitment and being responsible. So I all love you very much. Thank you for letting me share. Namaste. <laughs>